standardized testing. I feel like I'm not overstepping when I say it's become the bane of nearly everyone's existence. From teachers to students, standardized tests seem to cause nothing but headaches. And it seems like it shouldn't be an issue. I mean, it's just a couple days out of the year. All you have to do is sit down for hours on end in complete silence, take a test focusing solely on math and reading comprehension and answer ridiculous questions. The problem is it isn't just impacting a couple of days a year, it's actually impacting all of it. Every day of school is carefully designed to teach students just how to pass that test. Teach to the test has become a common expression And while days on end are wasted focusing solely on practice exams or screening kids that did a math problem just a little differently than the way they were taught, everything else seems to be falling by the wayside. This is the educational world built by No Child Left Behind, focusing on math and reading comprehension and not much else. In 2002, American teachers and students alike were thrust into a new normal where subjects like history and social studies were pushed to the side to ensure that the United States could catch up with the rest of the world on two other subjects deemed more important. School became less about teaching students how to think through their lessons carefully and critically and swiftly morphed into teaching students how to simply pass a test. And newsflash, your teachers hated it too. Just like you probably hated sitting through those boring practice tests, they also hated giving them, but they had to do it or they risked their school funding the school's livelihood from the federal government could be slashed if they didn't do this. Instead of helping the schools that seem to be falling behind with carefully crafted interventions backed by research and proven strategies, the federal government decided to go the opposite way. They punished them. Does the school have a few students that failed the test? Strike one. Have they been failing tests consistently for a couple of years? Strike two. Did they try to restructure the entire school, but not the curriculum to fix the problem to no avail? Well, strike three, you're out. And just like that, with little to no assistance, the schools struggling the most would have their funding ripped away from them. And in some special cases were even closed down. It seems backwards, but for almost a decade, this is exactly what was happening all around the country. And more schools were falling behind than ever before. So what happened? Why did the country decide to enact this new law that seemed to defy all common sense solutions? I'm not 100% sure on the reasoning, but one thing is for sure, children were definitely left behind. Hello everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the 2001 bill that sought to save all children. At least that's what they made it sound like. And that's right, everyone, it's no child left behind. At a first glance, back in the early 2000s, the bill seemed like it would truly be the solution to a horrifying catastrophe in the United States' education system. The country was not the best in the world, and in fact, it wasn't even close. At the time of No Child Left Behind, the United States was 15th behind countries like Finland, Canada, and France in reading literacy scores and the math scores were even worse. So naturally, this was an American disaster. After all, the United States had been so excitedly proclaiming that it was the best at absolutely everything for basically its entire history. And now it was behind in education? This would simply not do. Of course, there was also a military manpower crisis happening in 1999, and the government needed some creative way to fix that issue too. But don't worry, I'll get to that part. Now, as the country was falling behind, they developed a plan to fix the issue. No child left behind. President Bush touted the revolutionary bill as the perfect solution to ensuring that the country addressed inequality in education and maintained its competitiveness. But what was it exactly? What was this plan? Well, that's a bit of a loaded question. The bill actually has a lot in it. In fact, it was over 100 pages, but don't worry, I'll give you a little rundown. You know those standardized tests that we all had to take, the ones that lasted for days and asked insane questions like how many watermelons little Jimmy would have if he bought 100 and stole a million before selling five, which side note, why was it always an insane amount of something? Like why couldn't they come up with a better analogy? Well. Those analogies, you have the No Child Left Behind bill to thank. 
The law required states to test all of their students and report those test results back to the federal government. They had a few years to bring their students up to the proficient level on the tests, and if they didn't, the schools would face consequences like a downgrade in federal funding. You may be thinking, well, that sounds like it's going to backfire against schools that are already understaffed. And hey, you're right, but we'll get to that. The new law also required that all teachers met high standards of certification. Was there extra money in the budget to pay these highly qualified teachers that they deserve? No, but I guess no one thought of that part or no one cared. If the schools couldn't meet these new requirements, they faced some consequences, but they had a couple of options. The first was that they could provide free tutoring to students who were in fact falling behind, otherwise known as not reaching proficiency in their standardized testing. That, or they could provide students with the opportunity to switch schools in the same district using federal funding. If the school still couldn't improve their standardized test scores, they were faced with sanctions or even shutdowns by the state. And that's the very, very quickest rundown of what No Child Left Behind is. Maybe you saw some red flags already, or maybe you didn't. But in 2001, it seemed to be all the rage. There were some small complaints that the federal government might have been overstepping its boundaries in the education system, but other than that, everyone seemed in general agreement that this new law was going to be the best thing to happen to the United States. In fact, in January, 2002, it was passed with overwhelming bipartisan support, which quite frankly, sounds like a fever dream considering where the United States government stands now. When's the last time you really heard overwhelming bipartisan support for anything? And for a while, it seemed like everything was going to plan. Studies found that the test scores for children of color were improving, which was one of the biggest goals of the bill. But as time went on, that supposed success seemed entirely short-lived and instead of creating solutions, No Child Left Behind seemed to be promoting bigger and bigger problems in the United States' education system. In fact, children, schools, and teachers were all being left behind. Remember how I mentioned that military recruitment was down in 1999? Well, I bet you were thinking, what the hell does that have to do with this new law that was meant to ensure equity in education and make the United States more competitive internationally? In 2002, shortly after the passage of one of the most well-received new laws in the history of the country, Sharon Shea Keenely, who was the president of Mount Anthony Union High School in Vermont, received a letter that shocked her. It was from the military recruiters and they demanded the names, addresses, and phone numbers of all her students. Sharon was amazed at this sudden request. Sure, the school had invited recruiters for job fairs, career fairs, and other things like that, but never would they just hand over all of their students' private information. We don't give out a list of names of our kids to anybody, says Shea Keenely. Not colleges, churches, employers, nobody. So what the hell was going on? And why were recruiters suddenly demanding private information of literal children? Well, within the No Child Left Behind bill was a sneaky little addition, a rule that required high schools to turn over the private information about their students under the threat of defunding if they were to refuse. Before this new rule was enacted, schools had denied access to military recruiters over 19,000 times, a fact that representative David Fitter from Louisiana found to show an anti-military attitude and thought it was offensive. He and others that participated in implementing this new law most likely did not think about the fact that schools probably just didn't want to give out their students' private information. Maybe schools, especially those in higher poverty areas, didn't want recruiters pressuring students who felt like they had no other choice. People might not have been so excited about the so-called education bill if they knew what was actually in it considering stories that came out at the time certainly made it seem like this new military requirement caught them all off guard. The American Association of School Administrators chief lobbyist, Bruce Hunter said, "'We feel it is a clear departure from the letter and the spirit of the current student privacy laws. Now other people will want our lists. It's a slippery slope. I don't want student directories sent to Verizon either, just because they claim that all these kids need a cell phone to be safe." And he was right. It was a slippery slope that seemed like just the beginning. Like this wasn't just normal employers trying to get student information. It was military recruiters who have a less than ideal history of targeting the most disenfranchised families and not asking for information anymore, but demanding it. And this was all happening under the guise of a bill that was supposed to focus purely on education. 
Sure, students could ask to have their names withheld from recruiters, but only if the schools made them aware this was even happening and they turned in a form by a specific deadline too. Some schools didn't even give kids the luxury of knowing the deadline, despite that being written into the law too. How many times while you were a kid, did you just stick a piece of paper into your pocket and never think of it again? So, you know, like most of us, more kids had their private information shipped off to recruiters and recruiters which kids knew were vulnerable just because of their address. In fact, recruiters made more visits to low-income schools than they did to supposed affluent schools and preached a life of freedom, healthcare, and education. Ignoring the multiple studies that show joining the military at a young age can increase the risk of substance abuse, depression, and PTSD, well, they did what they did. You can't really put that on a pamphlet, although they should be legally required to, in my opinion, at least. Under the guise of education, military recruitment had snuck its way into schools in a way that had never been done before. But this is just the beginning of the issues with the No Child Left Behind law. The rest came from all of the requirements that were supposedly meant to help the children. And I know you're about to be shocked and surprised here, but it turns out they didn't help. While some studies touted the bill as a success for closing the equity gap in education and improving overall math scores, that success was much less impactful than they would have you believe. It was not enough to make up for the massive gap in scores between black students and their peers, and the supposed success varied so much between states that it really was not making a difference nationally at all. Sean Reardon, who did research at Stanford said, Comparing the magnitude of these effects is akin to comparing the speed of different glaciers. Some are retreating, some advancing, but none so fast that one would notice a meaningful difference except over the span of decades or centuries. The law was just all grounds too strict. There were no exceptions if teachers were able to pull students up substantially from the year before if they still weren't at the proficiency level that was meant for that school. And the teachers and students had failed, which means there were consequences for essentially everyone. Then there were the subgroups, which included race, disability, and socioeconomic status. Schools had to report their data using these subgroups, and if one group underperformed, the entire school failed. Again, it didn't account for those students that might have issues reading or concentrating during long, boring tests. It didn't account for the fact that some of those tests were also likely racially biased. And again, if one group failed, the whole school failed, and that's it, no exceptions. It didn't at all address the problem of why there was inequity in schools or the reason why certain groups would underperform. It just punished people for it. This seems to be America's normal course of action, by the way, like don't acknowledge why bad things happen, just punish people who happen to be in the circumstances of said bad things. It never seems to work out well, but the country just keeps trying this same method over and over, hoping for a different result, but surprise, there is no different result. Then there's the whole other glaring issue in the achievement gap that No Child Left Behind, they did absolutely nothing to address. And in fact, they made it worse. As Linda Hammond writes, with high spending schools outspending low spending schools at least three to one in most states, multiplied further by inequalities across states, the United States has the most inequitable education system in the industrialized world. No Child Left Behind did nothing to address this issue. Some schools just inherently have more. They have more money for the best teachers, the best supplies, and the best facilities. Meanwhile, others are left in the dark with less money to spend on everything necessary to enhance children's learning. Sure, the law allocated a very small amount of funding, but it didn't put a dent in the issue. And what do you think happened? Well, the schools that had the money to spend were fixing the issues they were having and were able to improve. If they were threatened with sanctions, they could hire more teachers, buy more books, and do anything they could to help their students thrive. But what about those other schools? What about the schools that didn't have the access to that level of funding? Well, they were virtually trapped. When they were threatened with sanctions, they didn't have the money to fix the issues. And when they were asked to restructure, they didn't have the money to make substantial changes. So schools were closed down and that left many children, particularly the most vulnerable children, left behind. What was meant to make education more equitable for students of all backgrounds in all areas, and it just wound up doing the opposite? Like who would have ever guessed that would happen? For schools where many children were struggling, it was like the law felt like quicksand to them. 
Donna Brown, who was the director of federal program monitoring in North Carolina, told NPR that when she first arrived, there were only nine schools that were facing improvement sanctions. Only four years later, there were over 500. It didn't address any underlying issues, it just punished. That was it. But of course, there's more. Again, have you heard the expression, teach to the test? Well, this law is where that expression hits its stride. Instead of teachers spending their time teaching kids things like, I don't know, critical thinking skills, study habits, and actual information they need to utilize and be successful in real life, they spent their time teaching students how not to fail a standardized test. On average, teachers were spending about 30% of their time just teaching students how to pass the test. And as you can imagine, it's quite draining, not just on the students, but on the teachers too. According to an NEA survey, by 2015, this new way of teaching had driven half of the teachers at the time to consider leaving teaching altogether. And remember, the law only focused on two aspects of education, reading comprehension and math. With almost all of the school year being dedicated to teaching these two subjects, social studies and arts were falling behind. The Center on Education Policy found that on average, students were only spending 178 minutes per week on social studies lessons. Meanwhile, 508 minutes were devoted to reading comprehension and 323 were devoted to math. I hate to break it to everyone, but history is important. There's a reason it needs to be taught. Haven't we heard the phrase like, those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it and you know, history repeats itself? Well, with no child left behind, an entire generation of children were prevented from learning these important issues. Then, as more funding went towards math and reading comprehension, music and art classes were slowly stripped away. Administrators and teachers alike were begging schools to use the funding to promote the arts in their districts and consider the arts to be a core subject. Of course, the arts don't make the United States academically competitive in the eyes of the government, so this wish never came to fruition. Slowly but surely, the funding for music, education, art, and more were all stripped away. Standardized testing, strict guidelines, threatening struggling schools, and subjects falling by the wayside. This was the legacy of the law that was meant to be helping children. As 2015 came rolling in, people were starting to sound the alarm that the education system might be worse off than it was before, that No Child Left Behind was a complete and total failure. The government swept in claiming they could save the day, but could they? So does everyone remember why we started this whole experiment in the first place? The United States was falling behind in education internationally. And at the time that No Child Left Behind was put into law, it was around 15th in the world in math and reading. You would hope that those statistics would be slightly better a decade later, right? I mean, the country spent a good 30% of its time teaching these subjects, testing children like crazy, and allegedly did everything it could to make the education system better. Well, that's not what happened. Instead, the country actually fell even further behind, which is laughably horrific. Almost a decade after the law was passed, the United States was ranked 28 in math. Perhaps even worse, the country was even behind when it came to graduation rates. While the United States graduated about 75% of students, most other countries were at 95. So yeah, children were absolutely being left behind still. In an effort to save the country from the law that was passed that was supposed to save it, the government decided to go a different direction in 2015, introducing, and drum roll please, the Every Student Succeeds Act. This time, everything would be different, allegedly. It started slowly, with waivers for the schools that were underperforming implemented by the Obama administration in 2010. Instead of an all or nothing strategy, the waivers gave schools an opportunity to specifically target what was wrong in their school. Was one subgroup doing worse than the others? Okay, then they were asked to create specified interventions that would assist that group. Finally, there was some understanding that some students just might need a little bit more help than others. This way, it was far less likely for the entire school to completely lose funding as they did in the past. Oh, and the waivers began to put a little more emphasis on things other than just testing. States now had the opportunity to develop accountability systems that included things like principal observation, peer review, student work, or parent and teacher feedback. This time, the success of students or teachers for that matter could be evaluated beyond their test-taking ability. And that kind of makes sense. Some people just aren't good at taking tests. It doesn't mean that they're falling behind. 
After a few years of the waivers, the government finally decided to take it that next step further by replacing No Child Left Behind with the Every Student Succeeds Act. And at a first glance, it seems like this new bill might actually make the impact that the first bill sought to do. This time, when students fell behind, the school didn't lose their funding, but they actually received more. No punishments this time around, just help. This seems like pretty much common sense to me and probably what should have been done in the first place, but hey, maybe I'm the idiot. There's a reason why I'm not in politics, I suppose, right? The funding was meant to go towards resources that would help schools improve and were set to specifically go to those schools that had the highest dropout rates and the biggest achievement gaps. The new law also promised to put less pressure on testing. Instead of using federally mandated testing, states were now able to develop or choose which tests they wanted to use for their students. If they didn't want to standardize test their students at all, they could, but they had to find some other way to develop evaluation tools. The bill also found a way to maybe fix the situation created by No Child Left Behind, where social studies and the arts were pushed to the side. Any school that received more than $30,000 from a block grant provided by the federal government were now required to put at least 20% of that funding into ensuring students were well-rounded. This could be anything from language classes, music, art, technical classes, or anything they wanted really. But they couldn't just spend all the money on reading comprehension and math. Those days were dead. In addition, they needed to spend at least 20% of their funding on one activity that helps students be safe and healthy. And a little piece of me kind of wonders if this funding just went straight into football programs, but that's me guessing. I am not saying there's any facts to back that up because I did not look into that. That is just my hunch, my gut feeling, my thoughts and opinions. But overall, this new program sounded better. A lot of the worst aspects of No Child Left Behind seemed to be fixed. Maybe this was a way to bring a better and brighter, highly educated future to the United States programs. Well, about that. While the new bill certainly fixed some issues, it introduced a whole new array of them. We just cannot win ever. And sure, the revamp did some good, but some of the new rules definitely raised some pretty big red flags. Remember, for No Child Left Behind, teachers were required to be highly qualified. This was only an issue because in the United States, we don't pay teachers enough to be highly qualified. The common sense solution to this would be to pay teachers more, right? But for some strange reason, that is apparently just out of the question. So the new law just got rid of that rule altogether. Teachers no longer had to reach for the highly qualified standard. And that's a little terrifying. And it's even more terrifying now that we're seeing states hire people who are not qualified at all. I'm looking at you, Florida. I'm looking at you. Speaking of states making, let's say, interesting decisions when it comes to teachers, they also make very interesting decisions when it comes to resource allocation. With the power given back to the states to decide how they spend their money, what schools give their money to, and what programs they design, there is a massive concern that they may not be doing so equitably. Now, the federal government has little it can do about states that decide to spend money in an inequitable manner, and many critics are concerned that this inhibits equal opportunities for low-income students. Low-income schools are twice as likely to be assigned underqualified teachers, hindering their ability to compete with the higher income schools. And once again, that's widening the achievement gap. Data has shown that multiple states have not been meeting equity standards through the years. And with the federal government's hands tied, there's also not much that can be done. So giving all the power back to the states may not have worked well in the country's favor. Go figure. Attempt number two to save the American education system doesn't seem to be doing the best either. And the country just keeps falling behind the rest of the world in education. So what can be done? What are other countries doing that makes them so successful? Before we try to take a look at other education systems and trying to see where maybe we can improve, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsors. Your hair is unique, so your hair care should be too. Function of Beauty makes products that are 100% customizable with ingredients designed and formulated to meet your specific hair goals. And Function of Beauty is the world's first fully customizable hair care that creates individually filled shampoos, conditioners, styling, and treatment formulas based on your hair type. I have always had dry hair, so I am always looking for a shampoo or conditioner that's gonna take me to the hydration station and have my hair feeling healthy and softer again. After you choose your goals, you choose the color and fragrance, or you can go dye and fragrance free too, which is a fantastic option if you have a sensitive scalp. Then you'll get your freshly filled formula delivered straight to your door and you can prepare for good hair days ahead. They even offer discounts and benefits when you subscribe. So start giving your hair the personalized care it needs. 
Go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to take your hair goals quiz and you'll save 20% on your first order when you subscribe. No commitments and you can cancel anytime. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to let them know you heard about it from our show and to get 20% off your first order. Again, that's functionofbeauty.com slash casket to take your hair quiz and save 20% on your first order. So the whole teach the test thing clearly didn't work, giving states the overwhelming power to control their education without any threat of discipline should they be inequitable doesn't seem to be working either. So what else could the United States do? And what are other countries doing? Well, first off, how about paying your teachers? No Child Left Behind had it right when they required highly qualified teachers in schools, but then they got it all the way wrong when they didn't require those teachers to be paid for their quality. Most other countries provide additional funds for competitive salaries. They even offer ongoing professional development for teachers. While No Child Left Behind was actually reducing training for teachers in lower income areas, it should have been doing the opposite. As for the whole teaching to the test thing, the country doesn't necessarily have to throw that out entirely. Most countries use assessments as a way to evaluate the curriculum and develop plans to make improvements. Instead of punishing schools that do poorly or not allowing students to graduate if they don't reach a certain threshold, the tests are simply an evaluation tool. That's it. In fact, in some countries, it's actually illegal to use standardized testing as a way to deny students from moving up a grade or even graduating. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Instead, students are evaluated on all types of measures. Can they problem solve? Can they solve real world problems? Can they defend their ideas either in writing or by spoken word? It's way more focused on critical thinking than just straight memorization for the best of test-taking tactics. I mean, shoot, I remember taking, what is it like the ACT and the SAT and stuff like that and losing my mind, studying till three in the morning, having all these flashcards, crying, vomiting in the bathroom because I was so nervous that if I failed, I couldn't continue on in life. Like I remember that and I feel so many of you do as well. It was horrific. But then to add to that, I don't remember a damn thing that was on those tests. I don't remember why taking those tests were relevant. I don't remember really what I was supposed to be you know, studying for because I just crammed everything. The things and the subjects that I actually learned and were useful were done when I was working with teachers that were actually passionate and like gave a little bit more of a fuck than just you know the standardized test. There's so much stuff in school that's just cramming and memorizing, but there's not actual application of what you're learning. And I think that's what we're really missing here. But again, That's my opinion and kind of my memory of remembering how it used to be in high school. But speaking of that, something that should be taught in school are skills that can be used after finishing school. Who would have ever thought that that would be important to teach, right? And I say that kind of sarcastically. Of course, students can't do anything without an opportunity to learn. There should be an increase in equity in schools, not the rapid decline that's happening now. Standards could be developed to ensure that every school has the materials they need to be successful. Once again, in most other developed countries, this is common sense and it's already in practice. It's only the United States where this is an issue. For now, citizens are unfortunately left watching in horror as the solutions to the United States education crisis seem to just keep making everything worse. Maybe one day the country won't be leaving the most vulnerable children behind. Hopefully one day it will change. But for now, we'll just have to wait and see. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. If you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to click my Linktree link in the description box. It's of course going to have all of my links nicely organized for all of my social media, projects I'm involved in, and literally anywhere where I'm going to be. So thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.